Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Shout out to Benny. Hi, Mr. B. How you being? Being pretty good there, Pat. Thank you very much for asking. Yeah, another day Mm -hmm. in paradise, yeah? You know it. Mm Mm-hmm. And David, you too, two producers, uh, David and Benny. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Um, We have a great show. And thanks to both Benny and David, thank you for what they do in getting the sound and the communication over the airwaves, AM, FM, as well as live on Facebook. And we've got a great show. Um, Benny, I want to just ask you this. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Here's a question. All right. I'm going to run off a few things and you tell me what you think they have to do with. Okay. Do I need a buzzer and a, a ding and a buzzer? No, I'll, <laughs> I'm ready I'll for do, this because they're I'll ready do, if you need. I'll, I'll do a dinger and a buzzer. Right, right. Okay. I got it. Okay. All right. I'm just going to go. Yeah. Weight, weight gain. Sweating at night. So you have to change the sheets. Mm. Waking up in the morning and just feeling uncomfortable in your skin. Doing a presentation at the office, and by the time you're done, you've just pitted out that beautiful blouse you bought just for the presentation. Taking a look at, can I actually get sleep at night? And then, whoa, what is going on? What is happening? And will it ever end? Will it ever end? Well, I'll tell you what it is, Benny. You probably don't know. Any of us ladies that have gone through that level of change, and many people start, I, I was young, but this is a change that, has, that happens for us ladies as we go through life. And I just named a few things. I mean, this is why we've got, you know, joining us here today is somebody that knows, that understands you know, after many years in a senior corporate environment, and, and I bet, I bet she knows what I'm talking about, about pitting out those blouses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she left her high power <laughs> job studying nutrition, went on, is a registered nutritional therapist. But what is it about today in bringing the notion together of happy menopause? Now, I want to say that because it is a word that many women don't even say. But does it affect only women? Absolutely not. It does not affect only women. Because if you know your loved one, your your lady, your woman, her own woman, whoever that is, that person in your life, your mom, your sister, your spouse, your partner, your daughter, whatever it is, we are talking today about the M word, because if you don't know what you don't know about this, and you're me, and you're 36 years old, and back then, people looked at you like, no, you better go get an AIDS test, you better get this test, you better get that. But today, we're bringing a happy conversation to the forefront, because we've learned so much, and so is Jackie, and so she's going to be talking with us not only about what she's learned, but in her fabulous book, we're going to go through this and talk about what you can do. See, this is a different conversation. Used to be, eh, can't do very much. But now this is about doing. So great, Jackie. Thank you for joining me here today. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. So I just gave a couple of the symptoms or a couple of the things that uh, my experience is. I want to start out with symptoms because I think this is really for people, you know, to witness what happens when people go through hormonal changes and not be ridiculed or not be put down or not enter the world of hopeless and helpless. 
it's important for us to really blow the doors open about what this is and how it shows up in our lives and, and what happens at different stages of it. So in your book, The Happy Menopause, what are some of the, what are some of the effects of this on people? Well, I think the, the first ones that we start to notice, uh, perhaps in our early to mid 40s, are the psychological and the emotional symptoms. Because the first hormone typically to start reducing is progesterone. And that's the one that can bring on all the issues like anxiety, low mood, um, depression, loss of confidence, brain fog. And of course, you talked about being in that corporate situation with the presentation. Now, not only might the, the blouse be a problem, but you might be thinking, what's happened to my brain? Why can't I remember things like I used to? And look at the younger women around the table and think, what are they thinking of me? Oh, so it can be very stressful because that usually happens much earlier than you'd expect. And a lot of women are still having regular periods. They don't know much about the menopause. So they assume, well, it can't be that because I'm still bleeding every month. Um, and then they start to worry, could it be early onset Alzheimer's? You know, what is wrong with them? Are they going mad? When actually it's all down to the hormones. You know, and this is really part of the conversation back, you know, if you go back a number of years, I don't think we actually knew what we what we now know about what to do. And I think that's really for you when you're coming out of the gate and, you know, this is your life's work. It's passion for you. You know, you're talking about a one stop solution for every woman that is trying to juggle what goes on with menopause in their daily life and changes. And if there was ever a time where this conversation needed to be had, it's right now. Because women right now, not that men are not, but I will say women right now are being put to a test they've never had to endure before. And my gosh, every aspect of their being is being touched or stretched or strained. And so this compounds an already volatile situation. This has never been more important for women. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think the, the context we're in right now with COVID, I think it's hit women particularly hard because they're the heart of the household. They're usually the ones worrying about, you know, when we're in lockdown, can you get the food in? They're usually the ones checking on the elderly neighbours, worrying about the elderly family, worrying about everyone else except themselves at a time when actually there's a lot going on with their own bodies that's causing them a lot of stress. So I think it's it's always hard and midlife is a really tough time for women generally, but I think we've got an extra dimension this year, which makes it even harder. You know, what was it for you? And, and I love this question because usually when somebody gets tapped on the shoulder to do something, you know, there is this innovative, creative, come to action mode. What was it for you? What was it for you where you said, I have got to do something about this. I've got to educate people. I've got to pull some information together to help women. What was that for you? That's a great question. Uh, it was about five years ago. Um, and I was asked to join a, a conference about menopause. And there were four medical professionals, professors, doctors, and then me representing the nutrition and lifestyle side. And um, it was actually quite stressful because I was the last person to speak and they'd all talked for ages. And so my slot from having that much time, I had, you know, 10 minutes to finish. And I found it very frustrating, but I did what I could in my 10 minutes. I changed my entire plan and I just came out with what I thought was the single most important thing to do. And what really struck me at the end when the event finished and there were drinks afterwards um, is that all the women there, I was surrounded. And I, I was really quite shocked because I felt a little bit like the spare part there with all the, the medics and as if I was the token sort of lifestyle one. But actually so many of the women were saying to me, we didn't know this. We didn't know that there were things that we could do with diet and lifestyle that could make a difference whether they were taking hormone replacement therapy or not. And, and that really shocked me. And I thought, you know, I need to get it out there because not enough people are talking about the menopause and they're certainly not giving all the information to women so that they can make the right choice for them. Well, I mean, this was really part of my journey. I mean, I'm probably 
typical and probably went down the path that many people went down, especially for me, started re relatively early in life. Um, well, then it did. I'm not so sure if that's true anymore. Um, but we did not have a sense of some of the things that you mention and outline in this book. Because when I went through this book, I thought, wait a minute, not only what Jackie's got in here talks about what the symptom is, but some of the things that maybe women are not aware of, some of the symptoms that you would just blow off and say, oh, just another headache. I got the kids, I got the job, just another headache. And so when we come back, I want to go through and talk with you about what do we do to manage? And for many of you out there, as I was talking over the weekend, well, what happens if you think, okay, I think it's gone now. Oopsie, not so much. Let's take a short break. And we're taking your questions. 1-800-930-2819. 1-800-930-2819, menopause, perimenopause, symptoms, and solutions. That's because Jackie Lynch is in the house. We'll be right back. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I felt, Benny. Hey, yeah, but we're trying to avoid yeah. that, though, right? Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> glad you played it. You know what? You know what? Okay, here's what you did. You brought sure. me back mm -hmm. to, like, that time. And the only thing that I felt really comfortable doing back then, because I'm telling you, I had a master bad case of this. Oh boy. And so out I went to the discos and the dancing and mm -hmm. any place I could go to dance. And I literally danced my way through the 90s, so to speak. But the bottom line was, is that's the one place you could go that everybody's sweating. Right. <laughs> you feel you, me on that? Your Studio 54 days, right? Oh my God. Uh -huh. I had the shoes too. I had the big platform shoes and all that. Oh boy. That's a seriously, I'm going to have to send you my like poofed hair picture. Yeah. I don't think Let's you do got. it. All right. I'm afraid to give it to David. I think he'll post it. <laughs> he probably will. <laughs> Jackie Lynch is in the house, The Happy Menopause. And this is a book, first of all, let me just say two things about it. Jackie's going to really take it away now. But thing one is that this is a book that literally will give you an opportunity to transform. And yet at the same time, we'll point out very specifically things that may be going on with you. And because they're going on with you, you need to be able to have a solution, a way to change them. Jackie, how do people get their copy of the book? How do they find out about you? Okay, well, um, it's in all the usual places, uh, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, all good bookstores. So your favorite retailer. Um, you can find out more about me at my website, which is well-well-well.co.uk or follow me on social media at well-well-well-uk. Awesome. Now, there's a lot of things I could talk about because I honestly don't know if you have left anything out of this book at all. <laughs> I don't think you left anything out of it. It's really cool though. Um, I wanna just ask you on your list, to make sure we absolutely talk about these things. I would like to hear your top five. Know this, do this, know this, do this. Meaning if you're experiencing this, here's what I can tell you. What's on your top five? Do we want to give it a countdown? We start with number five. Sure. I mean, number five would really be number one though, because I think it's all about getting the basics right. Because, you know, as we were talking earlier, no two women have the same menopause and there are so many different symptoms. You know, you can get oh, the classic hot flushes or the anxiety I mentioned. You might get the headaches, which you mentioned, the, the fatigue, the, the hair loss, the splitting nails, the weight gain, the, uh, the vaginal dryness, the loss of libido, the joint pain. It's so vast. I mean, luckily we don't get all of them. Usually we get a few, but it's different for everyone. So the first thing I think to think about is getting the basics right that sort of address everything. And then you can start to look at the different symptoms and the specific nutrition things you can do for that symptom. So my number five, which, as I say, is really my number one, <laughs> is um, uh, balancing blood sugar. If you get your blood sugar balanced, then because nutrition is a fabulous network in the body, it's going to address things in a lot of different ways. 
I, let's let's for people that may not know like what you're saying about the blood sugar let's talk about it because you're absolutely right one of the first things that i got introduced to um was this thing we call blood sugar and it doesn't sound like if you just like took it for like those words blood sugar you wouldn't have a sense of what that means and what to do about it but there does become an imbalance and tell us about what that imbalance might look like and, you know, is it a matter of, wait a minute, I'm having a blood sugar moment. I need to eat five almonds. <laughs> That's well, my excuse for eating five right. almonds, by the way. Yeah, well, <laughs> you've got it, yeah. Well, as most people might reach the chocolate. So let's talk about blood sugar. Basically, the body is programmed to keep levels of sugar in the blood in a very narrow band. And if it goes above or below that, then it creates a state of emergency. So if you've been packing away the sugary foods, the muffins, the cookies, the chocolate, the white refined carbohydrate, like you know, white bread, white rice, um, pizza, things like that, if you're having a lot of that, then the blood sugar spikes. And when that happens, the hormone insulin's released. Now insulin's job is to take clear it all out of the blood um, and send it off to the liver to be stored. But if you've been packing it away and there's a lot of sugar gone in there, then any excess will be stored as fat cells. So that's the first thing to know. Every time your blood sugar spikes, you are encouraging your body to lay down fat stores. And that's a big concern for women in midlife. Um, now, because it's an emergency response, it doesn't carefully calculate how to um, get you back to that nice narrow band. It just hoovers up the whole lot of sugar. And then before you know it, your blood sugar's crashed. And you'll know this feeling, you'll be tired, irritable, shaky, headachy, dizzy, and absolutely desperate for something. And the fact is, it's never for a green salad, is it? It's never the spinach salad we crave. It's always something sugary, carby, maybe a cup of coffee, maybe a glass of wine. It can depend on the time of day as to what you might crave, but it's something that your body instinctively knows will give you that quick fix. And the reason for that is that every time our blood sugar crashes, our body releases the stress hormones, in, uh, adrenaline and cortisol. And these are programmed to generate fight or flight. And of course, the hormones will freak out because they'll think, well, Jackie's got no sugar in her blood. She won't have the strength to fight or to run. So immediately, uh, cortisol takes action. It sends a message to the liver, sending it, asking it to send back those sugar stores. And it sends a message to the brain creating the craving. And so of course, it's a double whammy you release the sugar stores, the, you immediately start eating something. And so instead of going back to that nice narrow band, your blood sugar goes right up. You're thinking, oh, I'm okay now, I can deal with this next job I gotta do. In the background, insulin's saying, oh, I don't think so. The background to the day can be the highs and lows of blood sugar, which is gonna affect your energy, your mood, your weight, your sleep. So many of the things that are a concern in midlife. You know, what's interesting this morning is got in super early, you know, we're doing some great things here with the network. So I like to get in early, like I like to get in here before seven o'clock, Linda and I both got in. And, you know, if you're getting in here and you're getting up at five and you're coming in here and, you know, I've got my hydrogen water, that's my new thing. But okay. if you're getting in here, I hit a point at about 9 15 and i said to linda uh over in the next office i said man you know we brought in food for breakfast if we don't take a moment can we eat something now that's unusual for me right but i think i read your book um there's a behavioral change that has to happen here yeah. so let's talk about yeah this is really blood sugar and there's a lot in your book and we're going to do a deeper dive but this is also behavioral. What other things now are in your, are in your five, your five, four, three, two, one, but this was one, so we could go to two, it doesn't matter. Because in this is a solution which says, try to change this, right? Yeah, okay. So I'd say a few things. I think the first thing, uh, which is a must for women in midlife is to eat more protein. Um, <sighs> eat protein with every meal, every snack. It's gonna balance your blood sugar, going to support your bones it's going to help your body build neurotransmitters and we need those because they govern mood and memory and motivation those things that we can start to lose during menopause uh well it'll build muscle tone um not crazy muscle tone but muscles and you've got to understand that 
by the end of the menopause, by the time you've gone through this transition, you could have lost up to 40% of your muscle mass. So yep. protein for so many things, it will help with stamina and strength. You'll basically feel like a whole new woman if you're eating protein with every meal and snack. So your almonds, good stuff. So one of the things that I absolutely want to check in with you about is, you know, along the way, we pick up certain habits, we do certain things, a lot of debate about when you should stop eating at night, when you should eat again. Uh, and it's all tied into to this new movement without using any names to include full fat in your diet. Maybe you don't include all the dairy, but this idea of a no fat, no fat, no fat, right, which we went through. Give us a take about this. And I know there are two questions here. One is, where are you on this continuum of nutrition and fat? And then I want to talk about this other thing about when should you not put another something in your mouth before you go to bed? Okay. Well, I mean, on the fat thing, I think <laughs> where I stand is this. Um, the menopause is no time to be doing weird stuff. Um, you know, if you think of you know kids going through puberty, you want them eating right, you want them eating balanced. We need to be eating right and eating balanced. Now, fat has a big job. It doesn't make us fat. If it wasn't called fat, we wouldn't all get so confused. You know, it needs a new PR company. Um, fat, well, the body uses fat to make sex hormones. You know, we need our sex hormones, particularly going through the menopause. So I am not a fan of a very low fat diet. Um, we need to think about the types of fats. We need um, some saturated fat for the sex hormones, but not too much because that might affect cardiovascular health. And we need essential fats to balance our hormones, the omega-3s that support brain health, heart health, skin health, and so on. But let, let's go to the other thing too, is, you know, as we're looking at these, I kind of jumped in ahead of your five, four, three, two, one. You know, these are a couple of questions that have come in from our folks. Um, oh. Let's talk about a, a couple of others that are on your list. And then I do have a, a message a message question that came in. And But let's go through your list because I want to change something today, Jackie, right? Yeah, got that. Okay. Well, then I want you to have two handfuls of leafy green vegetables every day. Um, like spinach, rocket, arugula, um, kale, um, cabbage, you choose. Um, two of those every day. It's going to tick so many boxes. One of the big reasons is because it's packed with magnesium. And we love magnesium during the menopause because it calms the nervous system, regulates the body's response to stress, has you feeling better equipped to cope with whatever challenges you're facing. We need magnesium for bone health. Uh, we need it because it's actually our ignition key. Um, we can't start the energy production process if we haven't got a magnesium in our body. It kickstarts that whole um, chain reaction. Uh, we need it for the absorption of calcium for strong bones. Uh, we need it to uh, relax our muscles. So if you've got tired, aching muscles and joints, then that's a classic sign, again, that you might need a bit more magnesium. The leafy greens got magnesium in, they've got calcium in for our bones, they've got vitamin C, which we need for all manner of things, including bone health and skin health. And um, they're a great source of iron. Yeah, and guess what? Here's the thing I wanna say about those. Every time you mention a leafy green, people <laughs> cringe. But I come from a Mediterranean and a little bit of a Mediterranean Latino family. And here's what I wanna say. Leafy greens can be made a thousand and one ways. Does that matter? No, no, of course not. Make them any way you choose. Stick them in a smoothie, um, yeah. steam them, uh, add yeah. them to a salad. You're going to get the benefit. Uh, how about sauteed with uh, olive oil and fresh garlic? I like that. <laughs> Absolutely. My goodness. We love oh our olive gosh. oil. It's so good for I the know. heart. And garlic, oh, yeah. antiviral, antibacterial, super good for you. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, more about Jackie, more about the happy menopause. When we come back, two questions popped in from you all, fabulous listener audience, the best on the planet. One is, help me, help me. My hair is coming out. Help me, where did my hair go? 
Maggie has said pretty much just that. Let's take a short break, everybody. And, and oh, wait, and what do I do about it? Let's take a short break. We'll be right back with Jackie Lynch. The book is Happy Menopause. We're taking your calls. 1-800-930-2819. We'll be right back. Everybody, I'm telling you, it is unlike anything that you could possibly imagine experiencing. You guys out there that are listening to us, trust me when I say you not only have 103 fever, but boy, it starts on the inside. It works its way out. And you're thinking to yourself, I am dripping. I am dripping wet like as if I was on a court witness stand and I was being grilled by the best attorney on the planet. That's the way that feels. And what can you do? Well, we're going to go through Jackie's list. The book is The Happy, uh, the Happy Menopause, Smart Nutrition to Help You Flourish. Uh, Jackie is also someone that when you take a look and you go look at you know, Jackie's website, and I'm going to ask you for that. You go over there and take a look at what she's doing. You're going to see people, testimonials, consultations, workshops, all of the above. Jackie, want to give out your website again, please? Sure. It's well-well-well.co.uk. I like it. All right. So we've kind of gone down your list. A couple of other questions have come in. Um, one of them has to do with hair loss, but yeah, I want to see where that fits in, in your top five, because one of the things I'll tell you about women, you could do a lot of things, but when you start to mess with the hair, oopsie. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, I think our identity as a woman is often bound up in our hair actually. Uh, and it can become a, you know, a real emotional thing, whether you lose it due to illness or, or menopause or some other, you know, stress related issue. Um, so a few things to think about with hair. I mean, first of all, it's a classic, classic um, menopause symptom to start having thinning hair, poor condition, but it's also the sign of other things. So you should check in with your physician because um, a thyroid dysfunction can lead to hair loss, for example. Um, deficiency in certain nutrients, in particular iron, can lead to hair loss. So make sure you, you rule that out before you make any assumptions about what's going on with your hair loss. And just get a little bit of extra support and maybe have some tests run. Now, you know, we, it's back to basics again with hair, first of all. Uh, you need that protein because the hair follicles, you know, the, the hair is made of protein by and large, um, but it's no time for a very low carb diet either. And that again is the other extreme that people like to follow. And, you know, there are lots of carbs that won't work for you in the menopause. I've talked about the sugary foods, the refined carbohydrate, but we need the vegetables. We need the whole grains. We need those fruits with edible skins. They're carbohydrate too. And if you get rid of the whole lot of carbs out of your diet, then something's going to happen to your hair because actually the, um, as the hair follicles are producing hair, that's a very rapid turnover. So they need a lot of energy, those cells, to produce your hair. And if you're not getting enough carbohydrate, then your body will prioritize your vital organs and they'll send that energy to your vital organs to keep you alive. So you know, that means that the first thing that can start to look not great is your hair. It can start to look lank and thin because you're not, again, having the, the you're not giving it the energy it needs. And carbohydrate is our primary source of energy. So just take a look at your diet there. Um, take a look also at what's going on with B vitamins and biotin in particular, which is uh, from the B vitamin family. Um, anyone who's been looking at hair um, and nail replacement uh, supplements might have noticed that biotin is there. And commonly that can help with thinning hair. Um, I'd be looking at iron in particular. I mentioned anemia a minute ago. Yeah. And of course, yeah. one of the big issues for women during the perimenopause is um, flooding, heavy periods and flooding. So you might find for the first time in your life that you're anemic, perhaps it's never an issue before. But again, that could be part of the problem. So making sure that you're eating foods that are rich in iron. Oh, guess what? That's the leafy green vegetables again. Yes. Um, and if you're not vegetarian, then great, because meat is a really good source of iron. So is fish, so is egg yolk. So don't give yourself a joyless egg white omelet because you're missing out on all the good stuff. And I think you just nailed something, though, for a lot of us is that we have we have made some changes that really haven't been 
for the, the best of us. You know, the whole thing with the egg yolk thing, I did that and then I'm like, oh my God, why am I doing that? I just love eggs. And so we didn't understand the impact and that's why your book is so important, right? It's really to look at this is what you can do and this is how you do it. Um, what foods can I ask? I wanna jump to this. Um, hmm. Which foods should I avoid? Because I got a couple of questions coming in that are talking about specific things. So for example, I drink, I will drink coffee. I won't drink it all day long, but it has to be organic, fair trade, right? And so some people say, nope, you shouldn't drink any caffeine. Where are you on that scale? Well, you know, I'm, I'm a reasonable, moderate sort of woman. <laughs> <laughs> I don't drink caffeine myself, but that's my personal choice. I think that everyone needs to look at how they're getting on, how they're doing. Um, first of all, look at your sleep. If you're not sleeping well, you've got to look at your caffeine. Um, and it doesn't make any difference. You, know, you might think, oh, it can't be the caffeine. I have always been able to drink coffee after dinner. But that was then. Our metabolism changes with the menopause and things you thought you could do before, you may not be able to do anymore. So audit your caffeine intake and just see if you bring it earlier in the day, does that, does that make a difference to your sleep? Um, you know, the, the, our ability to metabolize caffeine relies on an enzyme in the liver. And uh, by and large, that's, that's genetic, which is why some people have always been great at having lots of coffee with no problem. And some people find they you know, just can't have it at all. Um, but most of us are somewhere in the middle. But again, the ability to produce that enzyme can get affected during menopause. Um, that can start to keep your liver busy. And the liver is a really important organ during the menopause because it's not just our detox organ. We might think of it as that because we keep it busy with caffeine and alcohol and medication and pollution and additives and preservatives and all these other things that are in our lives. But actually it's got hundreds of jobs. And one of those big jobs is to process and metabolize old hormones and get rid of them so that we're not having a buildup of, of hormones that could be again disrupting the balance and causing trouble so caffeine I think is just one example of those things that can actually keep your liver really busy when it could be doing other things like the hormone balance energy production fat metabolism thyroid hormone production and so on so I think go easy on the caffeine would be my thought I mean there are other reasons for that as well it's you know it's a very powerful stimulant so it can affect your blood pressure and you know cardiovascular health is a big deal for women post-menopause up until then our risk is much lower than men of having um, cardiovascular problems but that increases exponentially with the drop in estrogen post-menopause so things like managing your your blood pressure starts to become much more of an issue for a woman um, it also blocks the absorption of caffeine you know if you're mainlining coffee with your meals then you're not going to be absorbing your iron um, so there are just lots of things you need to be thinking about there and it massively disrupts your blood sugar because it, it interferes with the insulin response in much the same way as sugar does so it can trigger that whole up and down thing that I described earlier. Is that enough? <laughs> That's brilliant. So for me, let me ask, let me go back to a question I mentioned or chatted with you about during the break and it just came in <clears throat> and, and Maggie says thank you for that answer. Uh, the question came in is like, there are some books that say, do not eat, do not eat after six. There are other oh. books that say, eat after six, but only eat protein. I like to eat fruit af as dessert. Is fruit, what's the impact of fruit late at night? Oh, this is a good question. It's a really good question. I like fruit at night too. Okay, again, it's going to come down to you and, and your digestion, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a few things to unpick in that question, but let's deal with the fruit one first. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the reason I'm not always a huge fan of fruit as dessert is that fruit breaks down more quickly in the digestive tract than the rest of your meal will do. Now, if you've got a good regular digestion and you don't tend to feel bloated or constipated, then fruit as dessert's fine. But if you often feel bloated, um, and particularly if you've got a sluggish digestion, the problem that's gonna happen there is that the fruit will break down on top of the meal. The meal will take longer to pass through. 
the fruit will then start to ferment and you're going to get bloating, you're going to get gas, um, going to be really uncomfortable. So it comes down to you, you know, how do you feel? Because you probably didn't think it was anything to do with that fruit. If you have got those irritable bowel symptoms, then looking hard at your fruit is quite important. And I often say to clients in my nutrition clinic, you know, eat it a couple of hours away from a meal if you've got that sluggish thing going on, because it could make a big difference. So uh, that would be one thing to think about there. That's brilliant, because I just had this conversation with a friend of mine, and you know, she's made massive changes in what she eats and how she eats it, basically cutting out almost all dairy except for what, maybe heavy cream. But the fruit thing that you just nailed, right, as yeah. dessert, and she is like miserable. It's like, uh, what do you call that? Acid reflux or sometimes yeah. can't even sleep. And honestly, I didn't put that together. So what you're saying is slow metabolism may be to metabolize what you've eaten for dinner. Then you throw the fruit in. That gets worked out first. Exactly. And then it ferments in the stomach. And then, oh, my gosh, that is brilliant. Um, so, so what you're talking about, and this is the work that you do with people, I want to go back to what you said before. This is not a one size fits all. Like no. probably if you'd have looked at my friend, you'd have been able to, you know, get right to that point. But we, we tend to pull things off the shelf like a one size fits all when we're not in that realm. And I think that's what your, your book really talks to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip the break. A couple things that I didn't touch upon, but what else would be at the top of your list to say, look, this is what I'm noticing with the people that I'm working with. This is one of the key things in the book that we don't talk about enough. Well, I think one thing would be hydration. Ugh. Because actually, if you look at dehydration symptoms, what have we got? We've got fatigue, constipation, brain fog, uh, poor memory, loss of concentration, poor creativity, anxiety, headaches. Um, the list is long and guess what? Oh, didn't they sound familiar? They're all classic symptoms of the menopause as well. So I think before you blame everything on the poor old hormones, you need to start to look at what you're doing and are you helping yourself as much as you might? And lots of women are very poor at drinking water. I think I was, I was fortunate, I was born with a thirst reflex. So I've always got water on the go. My sister, not, not so much. You know, she, she gets stressed with a, what I would consider a very small glass of water. She can look at it for hours and think, oh, wow, so that's a bit too much. And I yeah, see that, like that. Women, you know, women who forget to drink and it has a huge impact. So I think that would be a big one that I'd pick. Yeah, it is essential. And isn't it really even more elevated when you are going through menopause? I mean, I don't know if there's a logic to this, but there's a logic to the idea that you are just perspiring. You are, and you really are, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding about it, right? You really are perspiring. So if all that water is coming out and you're not taking any, any in, what is the impact? Well, it's just like, you know, when you watch those movies and people are in the desert, I mean, eventually <laughs> it, it, you're dehydrated. Um, and in fact, you know, even 2% dehydration can affect the concentration of focus by up to 15%. It doesn't met, take much to, to make that difference. So you know what it's like if you're outdoors on a hot day, you, you know, you sweat, you, you drink. Um, and if you don't remember to drink, then someone will tell you to drink. And you'll certainly tell your kids to drink, won't you? Um, but yet somehow we don't think about the night sweats as dehydrating. Of course they are. It's just the same process. Wow. Um, Jackie. A couple of things here. Um, if somebody is listening today and they're thinking, well, wait a minute, I need to start. We're listing off your top five. These are things people can do right away. Um, a couple of things in here that we should talk about, thanks to the television show, Frankie and Grace, and the whole thing about libido. Um, this, they, they put a whole new face on this, by the way, but this is something that women don't really talk about, often get ashamed of, 
um, are often meant to feel ashamed. I mean, it's a whole nother area that really could set you down a path, spiral downward to not only just affect your moods, but also we didn't talk about depression here as well. I mean, it is that thing that is so shocking to women and they don't think there's much they can do. Can you talk to that for a minute? Sure, and it is a big deal with the drop in hormones. I mean, you know, testosterone is our arousal hormone. It's the one that sort of creates that sense of motivation and get up and go, which includes libido, of course. Um, and actually our testosterone levels are starting to drop much earlier. They, you know, they've, they've really significantly dropped already by the age of 40. And of course, once you add the drop in estrogen as well, then that can significantly affect your, your va va boom, if you like. Um, but also there's just so many other things going on because we have to remember that libido, a lot of it's in the head, a lot of it's psychological and emotional. So if you are feeling loss of confidence, that's a big one for women. They lose a lot of sort of mental confidence, but also physical confidence because they might've started to gain weight and they might think, oh yeah, am I as attractive? Um, as I was before, you know, do I want to take my clothes off because oh, look at that big spare tire I've got. Um, it, they might be struggling with real bone draining fatigue, which is big. Um, and of course, the, the, the mega one that can be part of that is vaginal dryness, because that can make sex painful. And, you know, nothing is going to affect your libido more quickly than the fact that you just want to keep your legs crossed because everything is hurting down there. So again, it comes back first, a few things. Get your blood sugar balanced. If you stop the excess stress hormones, every time your blood sugar crashes, remember, out come the stress hormones. And those stress hormones disrupt our body's backup plan because there was a backup plan. We weren't just abandoned to the menopause. You know, we've been going through for millennia. We didn't, you know, centuries ago, there wasn't hormone therapy then. Um, the body had a plan and our adrenal glands produced a small amount of estrogen post-menopause to keep us fit and well. The problem is they also produce stress hormones and they will always prioritize those in times of stress because it's our stress hormones that keep us alive. So inevitably the body's backup plan goes on the back burner. And that again means that that's gonna affect you and your symptoms and including your libido. So thinking about how you can regulate stress and manage that is gonna be key. Mm -hmm. But there are a few other things to think about. I mean, you can, you need to think about having those omega-3s because that's going to oil the vagina and make the, the tissue better you need vitamin c now vitamin c not just about the immune function although it is a powerful antioxidant it also um the body takes vitamin c and it uses it to produce collagen now what do we need collagen for it keeps our skin looking plump and young looking that's what i'm trying to do with my cheeks right now look plump and young um, and that includes the tissue in the vagina um, because it starts to recede otherwise um, you know, with, with that lack of estrogen. So the, the vitamin C can help with that support, the, the integrity of those tissues. And then there's some interesting research out there around uh, maca powder, red maca powder in particular. Oh, you yeah. Chuck, yeah. Chuck a spoon of that into your smoothie or across your cereals, because that, again, is, is something that just could help with your libido. Yeah, there's something about that, you know, that beautiful root that comes, well, at least the one I have comes from Peru. There's something about that, you know, uh, it's, it's the adaptogen nature of it as well. Um, I know we've got a few minutes left and I want to really get you to, how should I say it, weigh in on fat. Um, and uh, it's interesting. I've had a couple people say, cut everything out in dairy except heavy cream. I want you to eat heavy cream. And I never understood that, but it's a thing. Um, but then there are good fats. I love avocado. I love oils like that. Um, you know, can you talk about good fats for a moment? Yeah. Okay. So first of all, every food that contains fat naturally has all the fats in, the saturated, the monounsaturated, and the polyunsaturated. But what we tend to call the good ones are the monos and the polys. So that's the omega-3 you'll have heard about, the omega-6, the omega-9, which is by and large olive oil, oleic acid. Um, we, need the, we need the saturated fats, as I've mentioned earlier, for the sex hormones, but the essential fats, they're the ones that feed our brain. Um, so when you've got a deficiency in some of those omegas, that again can start to contribute to the issues like you know, the brain fog, the loss of concentration. 
Um, but also, I think probably the biggest research around the omegas is with the heart health um, and really the cardiovascular support. So it's not just, it's going to um, help to with uh, blood flow, circulation, but also making our blood vessels uh, more flexible so you don't get that hardening of the arteries that can come with age. Um, what else do we need it for? Well, we need um, that to oil the wheels of digestion. Again, if you're sluggish, you've got constipation, then you're going to need fiber, you're going to need water, you're going to need magnesium for the muscle movement, and you're going to need the oil, the omega-3, to move it all through. So I'm thinking things like nuts and seeds, but almonds, Walnuts are probably the best nut source of omega-3. Flaxseed, I haven't even gone there. A spoon <laughs> of flaxseed um, every morning with your cereal or smoothie, or, or maybe stir it into a soup if you don't like to have that for breakfast. Um, that's packed with omega-3, and it's got phytoestrogens in called lignans, which mimic the action of, of estrogen in the body. So that can help to relieve issues like hot flushes. So they're, they're great sources of omega-3. Um, and then, of course, you've got things like the avocado, um, the oils like olive oil, um, uh, avocado oil, walnut oil. They are all fantastic sources of these brilliant fats. Yeah. Oh, another question came in. I don't know if you're going to it's going to put you in the little hot seat. But before <laughs> I do that, please tell folks how they get a copy of the book. And thank you for taking your time. The other thing I want to mention to folks is at the back of the book, there's a, nu a nutrient guide. And I think that's brilliant. Um, how do we get to the website? How do we buy the book? Okay, the book's in all the usual places. So Amazon, Barnes and Noble, whichever bookstores you like, it's there. Um, if you want to find out about, more about me, my social media is at well, well, well UK. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And my website is well-well-well.co.uk. Okay, somebody picked up on the question about dessert and said, okay, can you help me out? I'm willing. I'm willing to not eat the fruit because, yep, that's killing me. Uh, what might I have as a little dessert? Not doing sugar, not doing cakes, not doing pies. None of that. What can I have? Well, do you know what? Uh, how about you have a couple of squares of dark chocolate? Because lower in sugar, it gives you that umami thing that chocolate does. Mm. But also it contains antioxidant compounds. It's going to help your libido. So what's not to like? I love it. Jackie, thank you so much for today. Before you pop off, I know we didn't get to everything. And I just wanted to ask you, what do you want to leave us with? What's your personal message for us today? Uh, my personal message is be kind to yourself during the menopause. Really take time to, to think about yourself. We women are hardwired to look after everyone else except ourselves. And this time it's for you because you really need to. So Think about your nutrition, think about reducing stress, manage your schedule, dare to say no, go on, I dare you, and free yourself up to have time to look after yourself and take the time to plan that you're eating well, that you're exercising well, it will pay dividends. I love it. And thank you for mentioning Don Kwai in the book. You're welcome. <laughs> I, I'm on a Don Kwai ginseng tea kick. Not oh, sure. cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I love it. I hope you'll come back. I know there's so much in your book. Thank you for helping women all over the world with this. Um, there is a lot to cover because it does. It's life changing, isn't it? That's why we call it that, isn't it, Jackie? Absolutely. It really is. I'd love to come back anytime because there are so many more things we need to discuss. I know. I know, but we have the best listening audience in the world and they were right on this, getting these questions out there and getting some answers. And yes, I want to just say to Judy, yes, what I did in my corporate career, Jackie, I bet you did too. What I did in my corporate career, I would bring in multiple blouses and shirts. I literally would have to do that back then because that's just what I went through. Uh, but Jackie, your book will help reduce that significantly. It literally will help. All right, everybody. Jackie, uh, like Jackie Lynch, as I said before, the happy menopause, a happy menopause, start nutrition, smart nutrition to help you flourish. And again, there's so much we didn't get through in here, but there's so much that you could learn and do now, not cost, not costly and immediate. Drink some water. We'll see you next time, everybody.